when it comes to general health concepts of a ketogenic diet, I, you know, I generally say you don't need to chase ketones because there's a ketone level, a beta hydroxybutyrate level of three, any better than a level of one when it comes to insulin sensitivity and weight loss. Right. Probably not. Right. But for something like a cancer treatment, does that make a difference? It could. Yeah. It really could. Um, and, but we don't know. But th- theoretically, um, I, I like to think that <clears throat> you kind of have to view everything that's happening in the tumor, all of these different mutations, the, the phenotype, the metabolic phenotype it's expressing, each subset is, is more or less important for a particular type of cancer. So one tumor type might be really, really dependent um, and thriving because of this high glucose metabolism. And maybe they have some of these weird epigenetic, uh, you know, uh, suppression going on, but it's not really that important for the success of that tumor, at least at that time. In that state, a ketogenic diet that lowers glucose may be important, and the ketone story might not be as important because they're not as dependent on the as- the mechanisms that this ketone signaling would target. But what about a tumor that is really, really benefiting from the um, the epigenetic silencing of these tumor suppressor genes? And maybe they're actually more oxidative in its uh, its capacity than a normal cancer. Um, well, in that case, maybe the glucose side of the ketone, the ketogenic diet is not as important for that tumor, but the signaling part is really important. So this <laughs> is going to make studying this very difficult because yes. you're going to need different protocols for every different type of cancer. Now, yeah. I want I kind of want to walk through this a little bit more. So when we talk about the ketogenic diet, are we talking about a b- specific type of ketogenic diet for cancer therapy, like the, the four to one where the, um, four times as much fat as there is protein and carbohydrates combined, which is not probably the average ketogenic diet that most people are eating. So do we have to make that differentiation when we talk about a ketogenic diet for cancer therapy? I think we will. Um, I think that most of the the research that's going on is looking at those more therapeutic types of ketogenic diets, something more akin to a classical ketogenic diet, like is used in, in epilepsy, something like a four to one. Um, and it's interesting in the preclinical literature, you'll even see, so yesterday at MHS, we had a presentation from Dr. Barbara Koffler. She uses an eight to one di- uh, diet wow. in her mice. Yeah, I know it must just be straight oil. Um, and, but this is because mice are a lot more resistant to getting into a state of ketosis than humans. So it's all very complicated, like knowing what to study in the preclinical models, how to put that, translate that into the clinical trials as we're designing them. Um, in my opinion at this point, and I think this is what's been done mostly, um, trying that strict therapeutic level, giving yourself the best shot, giving yourself the best shot to reduce glucose, reduce insulin while also getting ketones higher. That makes sense as a, let's get into clinical trials in this way. And then we can tease out, okay, in what situations might just simple low carb versus a ketogenic also be effective. That might be the case. This is what we have seen in epilepsy, right? For the first several decades, it was all this four to one ketogenic diet. And within the past couple of decades, people have started saying, oh, okay, well, a a low glycemic index treatment is actually sufficient for this type of seizure disorder or a modified Atkins or modified ketogenic diet is is sufficient, but we're just not there yet. And modified Atkins is probably, I think, what most people are eating for a ketogenic diet. Absolutely. And you brought up the point about about the mice and how it's hard for them to get into ketosis. So, you know, there was a study published recently um, that said a ketogenic diet is beneficial for the first week and then after that actually induces diabetes and got all the headlines <laughs> and well what did these it was a mouse study fed a 10% protein diet with hydrogenated soybean oil as mm. as the fat so the type of fat in these in these mouse studies makes a difference too because that's not what people are eating and Absolutely. so the different types of fat may have different types of effects so that's one of the problems in in trying to extrapolate mouse data to human data as well so it is. We clearly need more human data. So when's that coming? <laughs> Hurry up. When's it coming? It's on the way. <laughs> I wish research was faster than it is. Um, yeah. So scientists, there's a lot of inertia uh, in science. Yeah. Um, but, you know, even just seeing from from when um, I started this research about 10 years ago, it was not something, at least in the cancer field, that there were obviously some studies here and there. Um, but it was not something that was being discussed on a main stage. And it was not something that most oncologists had heard of or were open to in any way. 
um, <clears throat> we at that time, you know, in those early years would reach out um, to local cancer hospitals and, and just try to get perspective or, or, you know, even just like, can we come give a presentation about this, talk about this? Right. And there was a lot of pushback. Fast forward a few years later, and we're getting contacted by those oncologists because they want to know, right? right? Things have changed so quickly. So I would say even for, you know, science where things move slowly, this is accelerating very rapidly in part because conversations like you and I are having right now, um, getting information into people's hands so that they can go back to their oncologist and ask questions. And the oncologist now, you know, realize I need to, I need to learn more about nutrition. It's not something that I covered in, in my training. And so, um, you know, that's why these com- kind of conversations are so important. It's just getting the information out there so we can all move forward together. Yeah, I love to hear that, how it started with you knocking on doors and now <laughs> people are knocking on your yeah. door wanting more information. That, yeah. yeah, that's just fantastic. And so the other thing, though, to get into, we talked about the specific type of ketogenic diets, but also the specific type of cancers. And I think yeah. this is important because from what I understand, renal cell carcinoma and melanoma are two cancers that really don't respond to ketogenic diet or may even worsen to, with ketones, at least in mice, <laughs> compared to other other um, tumors. Now, is that true? And why would there be a difference? And Yeah, uh, possibly. Definitely possibly true. I am by no means of the opinion that ketogenic diet is going to be a one-size-fit-all for all types of cancers. Cancer is way too complicated for that. Um, I would say the preclinical data suggests that the majority of cancers seem to have uh, respond favorably to a ketogenic diet. There's a portion that from the preclinical data seems to not really care that much. And then, as you mentioned, there have been a couple of papers here and there that showed in this model, we saw a promotion. A promotion of, of, the, of cancer the cancer growth. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's a lot going on in my head right now <laughs> about uh, some of the complicated sides of why that might be. So let's take the melanoma example. <clears throat> That um, model is a BRAF V600E mutated melanoma. So this I'll pretend is, I understand <laughs> that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it is a, um important mutation that is present in a lot of melanoma patients, and it is um, a, a mutation that, uh, that affects one of the major signaling pathways in that tumor that really helps it grow and proliferate rapidly. Um, that paper showed that acetoacetate, the elevation of acetoacetate, um, could actually promote the growth of that, that model. Uh, this is interesting because this seems to be a signaling effect of ketones. So that same mechanism, the acetoacetate simulation of that pathway, is something that's also been reported to happen in skeletal muscle, which is why um, skeletal muscle can be preserved in models of skeletal degeneration. Hmm. Okay, so this is a signaling effect, a unique signaling property um, of acetoacetate specifically um, to, that promotes this pathway. This pathway happens to be really important for melanoma that carries that specific mutation. So, so not all melanomas. Um, no, I mean, it might be heightened to some degree, but it, that's a common mutation. And then it, if you had that mutation, then acetoacetate itself might it, it, you know, promote it. Okay, so that's what they saw in that model. We actually just had a speaker yesterday presenting her data looking at other BRAF V600D mutants that she was able to further elevate beta-hydroxybutyrate, and she didn't see that effect So it was specific to acetoacetate and not beta-hydroxybutyrate, which are two different ketone bodies. They are two different ketones. So these are the, like, this is why it's so complicated. These are the, the details we have to work out because... It's possible, it's absolutely possible that there's a cancer type that has a mutation and then this signaling effect, if it's there, it's going to drive that tumor to grow. But remember, you're changing tons of things within the tumor. So how important is glucose metabolism in that tumor? Is it as important as that signaling pathway or more important? Mm -hmm. Even then, you might have a net negative effect on the tumor depending on the importance of the things that are being targeted. Yeah. So some of this can drive people crazy because <clears throat> yeah. we don't have all the answers. No. We're in the very early stages. Yeah. But if somebody or somebody's loved one has cancer and wants to try this, they want to know that it's no. they're doing more benefit than any potential Absolutely. harm. And so there still is a bit of a limbo. But yeah. is there any, can you draw any lines to say for these cancers, you know, even though it's not guidelines, even though I can't, tell people, you know, individually, I would say, yes, in general, try it for these cancers. And for these cancers, maybe not. 
Of so, course, in addition to radiation, chemotherapy, yeah, surgery, yeah. whatever the, the uh, mm-hmm. general recommendations are from the Absolutely. cancer doctors. Absolutely. I'm, I'm a very strong uh, proponent of the data supports that this as an adjuvant is most promising. And there's even data that suggests that there's a really nice synergy from ketogenic diet with these standard of care therapies. So <clears throat> that's absolutely my position. You know, I so obviously I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a scientist. I can only speak to what the data suggests is um, is happening and what might be most useful versus not. <clears throat> I don't give any medical advice, of course. Um, I would say that there are types of cancers that there have been a lot more data in which is why they're the furthest along in clinical trials. They have the most clinical trials. A great example would be brain cancer. So um, the most preclinical data for ketogenic diet for cancer comes from brain cancer. Brain cancer, especially GBM, glioblastoma multiform, stage four brain cancer, also, even with standard of care, has a very grim prognosis. So in that um, setting, it really is the perfect scenario to test this out. And that's why there have been the most number of trials, right? So there's a lot of preclinical studies, and there's some clinical data that shows that this might have a nice effect there. Um, All the other cancer types, it's mostly coming from preclinical data, uh, saying that, you know, we need to test this. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say uh, the ones you've mentioned, you know, the melanoma story, that's obviously complicated, especially for those BRAF V600E mutant uh, mutated patients. Um, and we need to be more cautious. And, and, and then the renal cell carcinoma, <clears throat> that was interesting because that was <clears throat> a basically a, a large a, a portion of renal cell carcinoma patients will present with a perineoplastic syndrome called Stauffer's syndrome that basically causes inflammation in the liver and liver failure. And so the, uh, the, the, the study that showed this might not be a good idea for renal cell carcinoma was not because it was promoting the tumors. The tumors were actually growing more slowly in those mice. The, tu- the mice died because they developed this perineoplastic syndrome and caused liver failure. Interesting. Okay. So, which also speaks to why this is so complicated and why a patient has to have the oversight of their oncologist and right. their team on board. It's not just what happens with the tumor. You, you, I mean, there's so many... Other things going on and in the body when a patient has cancer is going through treatment and we have to, you know, there needs to be a really close eye on all of these other things. Yeah. So, Great um, point. yeah. And then, so the, the next step though, in talking about cancer therapies and nutrition and lifestyle changes is the tolerability of the therapy, yeah. whether it's the tolerability of radiation or chemotherapy. I mean, yeah. and this is where we get into that point of the statement we started this interview with the non-toxic metabolic targeted therapy. So the the non-toxic part, because let's face it, chemotherapy is toxic and people can get severe side effects. So does the ketogenic diet, and then we can also talk about plus minus fasting, help with those side effects of the chemotherapy? It's possible that it could. So there is some uh, data that suggests, uh, largely preclinical data again, to suggest that, um, that some of these things are more well tolerated. Also, it's possible if you're, um, if you see, if there's some kind of synergistic effect between com- combining these therapies, it's possible that we could actually use lower levels of these drugs that would reduce toxicity. This is all theoretical, of course, at this point, those things would have to be panned out in a clinical trial. Clinical trial. But uh, for a few reasons, we think that, yeah, it might actually you know, improve other aspects aside from just effect on tumor. We need to be thinking about quality of life. Right. Um, That's really important. And there is human data from small trials showing improved quality of life, better um, emotional functioning scores, better sleeping. People also like, you know, some of the other added benefits of, well, I've lost, you know, I've lost this excess body weight. I'm feeling younger, healthier, more energetic. Um, We think that for those reasons, people might be able to actually tolerate uh, some of the side effects of the standard of care treatment better, and that's that's we're starting to see emerging data that support that supports that. Yeah, it's a great perspective. We're treating the cancer, yeah. but we're treating the patient too. We're Absolutely. treating the whole person to get yeah. them feeling better and help the body with its own sort of anti-cancer fighting yes. ability, perhaps support the immune system. Absolutely. Yeah.